In the introduction video for this assignment, we talked about the characteristic of resources in negotiations. Specifically, we discussed the role of the ownership, the divisibility and the expected value of resources. As stated in the introduction, we will now take a closer look at the psychological processes in negotiations. When I speak about psychological processes, I'm talking about cognitive, motivational and emotional processes that affect parties' perceptions and behaviors. In the RON framework, we suggest that the characteristics of resources could be both antecedents to and consequences of psychological processes. In order to give you some examples on how resource characteristics affect our psychological processes and also how psychological processes affect our perceptions of resources, I will give you two illustrative examples of psychological processes that play an important role in negotiations on commons. Specifically, I would like to talk about parties' loss aversion and the so-called fixed pie bias. These are just two of many examples. You will find other examples of psychological processes in the articles provided in the library. So let's start with the psychological concept of loss aversion. Loss aversion is a well-established psychological phenomenon that was first described by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. It reflects the finding that people are more sensitive to losses than to gains. That means a loss of $100 has a psychological stronger impact on our perceptions and behaviors than an equal gain of the same amount of money. As a consequence, people's motivation to avoid losses is stronger than their motivation to achieve gains. But how does this psychological process relate to the resource characteristics addressed in the round framework? Parties' loss aversion strongly relates to the resource characteristics of ownership and valence. If you own a resource with a positive valence, for instance money, and we are negotiating on the contribution of this positive resource to a commons, we will perceive a psychological state of loss aversion. In this state, we are highly resistant to concede, which may hinder us to find mutual satisfying agreements and negotiations. In contrast, when positive resources are collectively owned and we start to negotiate the distribution of these shared resources, we are less likely to perceive the psychological state of loss aversion. As a consequence, we are less resistant to concede. On the one hand, this may help us to easily find agreements with the other parties. On the other hand, this may threaten the preservation of commons. If all parties easily concede and start to distribute resources from the commons, this behavior may result in a total breakdown of the commons. Interestingly, people's resistance to concede completely changes when they negotiate on the contribution or the distribution of resources with a negative balance, for instance in the case of waste disposal. Now, let's look at another example of how resource characteristics are linked to psychological processes. Another very prominent psychological phenomenon in negotiations is the so-called fixed pie bias. This bias is a specific cognitive heuristic in negotiations, which is characterized by the tendency to see the interests of the parties as opposed and to see the resources in zero-sum terms. In a zero-sum negotiation, it is impossible for one party to advance its position without the other party suffering a corresponding loss. If one side gets $1,000 more, that means the other side gets $1,000 less. In other words, the wins and the losses add up to zero. However, the more the interests that are involved in negotiations differ, the more likely variable sum agreements can be worked out. Variable sum agreements are solutions in which the sum of winnings and losses is greater than zero. This becomes possible when the size of the pie is somehow enlarged so that there is more wealth for the parties than there was in the beginning. Specifically, variable sum or win-win agreements are achieved when all parties get what they need most. 
Unfortunately, even if the negotiation allows for variable sum agreements, most parties fall prey to the fixed pi bias with the false assumption to see resources in zero-sum terms. In the end, the fixed pi bias leads parties to settle on suboptimal agreements. As pointed out in the Rohn framework, the fixed pi bias manifests itself through parties' ignorance of their different preferences for the negotiated resources. However, taking into account the expected value of resources may help parties to overcome the fixed pi bias. Specifically, parties need to consider each party's preferences for the negotiated resources, the balance of the resources and the party's different expectations regarding the future value of resources. This comprehensive perspective on resources may help parties to explore the integrative potential and achieve variable sum agreements beyond their fixed pi perceptions. Unfortunately, in negotiations with a single resource, it is far more difficult to find variable sum agreements. Still, there are some ways to achieve win-win agreements when we are faced with a single resource negotiation. First, we should analyze the divisibility of resources and, if possible, we should transfer the single resource into multiple sub-resources, as done in the example with the two sisters negotiating on the orange, which consists of two sub-resources, namely the peel and the pulp. Second, we could also try to take the time or the timing of resources into account. For instance, imagine a car-sharing project with a single car to be shared. Although this car reflects a single resource on first sight, integrative agreements can be found when the sharers use the car at different times. We have to keep in mind, parties' preferences for a resource can relate to both, to the resource itself or to the timing of its use. Finally, for some resources, integrative agreements can be found by taking the localization of the resources into account. Whereas a single book can be read by just one single person at a time, its content, when located in the World Wide Web, can be read by many people at the same time and all users can benefit from the single resource. Of course, these examples on the interplay of psychological processes and resource characteristics are, as always, not exhaustive. But these examples may give you an impression on the interplay of psychological processes and resources. To put it in a nutshell, never start a negotiation without systematically analyzing the resources and their characteristics.